Um, we on does? Good to go. Merrick, how are you? Mate, great to be here. So good to have you. Thank you. Why? <laughs> <laughs> this is, I, I, I don't know if there's been as much pre-ramble chat of any podcast we've ever done than yours. Like, you've come in hot. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually pretty intense. Yeah. I, I usually walk in and at some stage I just go bang and it's it's on. There is I know I know very very well that I'm, I can be quite an intense character, but I'm genuine. I'm like what why I, you know I don't play football. Don't just, you? No. No. <laughs> no. So I'm I'm kind of going did you how, what's this bloke done? that he's managed to run out of AFL player options to have on his podcast no. and he's had to resort to a 50-year-old male. Well, I, I, to be completely honest, uh, even to the production of this, like, uh, footy's a part of our show. We love it. Yeah. I know you do you like your footy. Yeah. I don't really want your opinion on it, to be completely honest, because you're a Collingwood <laughs> nuff. And End like, of I, interview. I can't. <laughs> like, if, if it's here today and you're thinking that I'm going to be asking you about you, what you think, like, oh, you were I'm... telling me about something Collingwood before and I genuinely fell asleep. Like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Like, you were saying something about Collingwood and I was like can this bloke shut the fuck shut up? up I don't care like if I wanted to read something I'd go on Twitter okay yeah, like yeah, yeah. You keep that yeah. to your big footy forums yeah. Yeah. I don't care about yeah. your opinions of fair. Collingwood okay. today fair, but just you, to make that really clear just to make it really clear to you I grew up in Eltham which is a Collingwood draft old school Collingwood draft area no, no. I grew up with a club I love Collingwood I don't care alright wait for it wait for it <laughs> but I live I live in Sydney right yeah. so talking about AFL um, you don't get a lot of it in Sydney so when yeah. I come to, to Melbourne it's like binging yeah, you know what I mean? so I was like, I just walk around just going people here anyone in Melbourne is happy to talk about <laughs> yeah, footy so it's just like the first thing I do is I bump into somebody like Peter Hallier and just go let's just double down on a Collingwood conversation yeah, yeah. and exclude everybody else in the room Yeah. So are, you, are you in one of those because I know there is some like group chats of like some real nuff bags of calling are you in one of those there as well yeah okay i think i'm in the one you're talking yeah. about <laughs> <laughs> oh, i've heard Pete talk about yeah there's yeah. there's a couple yeah i'm in i'm in one of those ones but and look to be f- completely honest too, there's nothing um it, there's nothing tawdry about it at all it's like it's blokes talking about just calling, footy. Yeah, yeah and hanging shit on each other but um, it's good to your question though about why i wanted you on the show and i say this in genuineness like i think that i Obviously, was young, uh, old enough, and young enough to sort of see your uh, career with American Rosso and those mm-hmm. bits and pieces. But I think for me, where I sort of really got interested in what you were doing um, was when I saw you on SAS, and I was like, "Fuck, this guy is different to what I thought he was like." Like, I had no real preconceived ideas by the fact that you're very, obviously a very funny character. I am. But I then know. I saw you are. But then I saw this other side of you around, you know, a depth and humility. And obviously, there's been a fair bit go on in life and you know very honest with yourself but Mm -hmm. then there's also this comedic relief as well that i find that's really cool and i think that's something that i really love about you and respect and admire something i try and do with myself too is be multifaceted and not just be one thing yeah 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 like you can be funny as fuck and have a joke but you can also have depth and want to get better and want to challenge yourself and do these bits so from afar i feel like i somewhat know you and really resonate with you because of those things so that's why i wanted you on the show yeah, it was an interesting point you made there, Dill, because like it's people often become uncomfortable when they see a different side of somebody, right? Mm. So people see people, other people, in one dimension and they see them as like a kind of flat figure. They're a comedian. They're a football player, right? Whatever it is, right? So they identify that. When they see them outside of that context, it can make that person feel a little bit uncomfortable. But if you actually think about it, if a person is not multifaceted, if they're not multidimensional, if they don't have more than that one face card, then that person is actually not somebody that you should put too much weight in. They're probably a little bit unhinged. You know, if, if It's like a comedian who is always on right don't get me wrong i'm always on i'm on right now right when i say on i mean drugs but the um (laughs) i'm joking or am i who knows you can't tell with me um but if if a comedian is constantly on they just wear you down and there's no you're sort of waiting to see where their depth is like you're Mm. saying you know and you can't trust people who can't reveal a little bit of depth mm. but the, the face of uh, a personality or a person in media or in the spotlight is that you are one thing mm. and when you break from that sometimes you can be criticized for it um, and sometimes you can be um, lauded for it so it's just what it is for me you know there is um, a, a, a lot of different types of Merrick And that is something that I've had to reconcile. One of the hardest challenges I've ever faced in my life was 
coming to that realization and sitting with that and being comfortable with the fact that I'm not one thing, mm. that I'm not even two things or even three things, I'm really quite broad. And understanding that I'm a polymath and my mind is is different and seeks out different things. And that, you know, that kind of acceptance and awareness of what you're talking about um, has has given me great um, uh, ability. Yeah. It's so cool. I've got two questions and I often do this. Only two. No, no, this two is just this off is going to be a short podcast. No, no, I've got two just off that. Go. One is, did you always have that? And the answer I'm sensing is no, when maybe you were early days of comedian. Like, was that something that was in your top of your mind? Like, do you think you had good balance? And two, more of a point actually is when you were talking about that of, of being a comedian, people go, mm-hmm. they're always on their comedy. I find that in this space that we both really enjoy of personal growth and yep. exploration. I find like there's so much content at the moment where I look at and I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like I'm one of those people. No, you're not though, because oh. you have another side that's comedy and it is like a part where you can chill. So it's like, you know, you watch your videos where you do these extreme challenges and you're doing yep. this stuff and I love it. And the next slide, you're just doing these jokes and being like, I'm a fucking idiot. Yeah. It's like, what do you know that thing that I'm sort of referring yeah, yeah, to yeah. is like you watch this sort of it's not virtue signaling because it is a great thing to be sharing, but it's, but it's like you've got to have something else to it because otherwise it's not relatable. Yeah, and it's like yep. I love David Goggins. Yeah, Goggins. I think he serves a great point. Yeah, but I also think like sometimes I'm like, shut the fuck up, David Goggins. Like, but I love him as well. If that makes sense. Yeah, I know. I know, you know exactly what you're saying. saying. Yeah. I've read his book, and um, I, I've certainly. I'm actually thinking about doing one of Goggins' challenge yeah. um, uh, in the coming oh, weeks, which, hear about that. which is the the four four forty eight. I might be doing that, so I'll train up for that. But um, I agree. Like I really, really like him, but it, there's like a, a constant um, intensity there that is one-dimensional. It's mm. he's always Dave Goggins, you know. Whereas, like, if somebody said to me, "There's a video of Dave Goggins making a sponge cake," I'd like, "Fuck yeah, let's go yeah, and watch well, that." He What's like he doing making yeah. a sponge cake? <laughs> and how hard is that sponge cake going to be? Yeah. Like a rock, <laughs> you know, because be. everything he does is extreme. Maybe but, a rock what, cake. But he becomes almost like there's. Uh, um, a predictability, yeah, and that's that can be really really good because you know people have got the familiarity with that predictability, but also too it is really nice to kind of show a little bit of diversity and uh, the most you know and I think about this with social media um, a bit with what I do on social media you know there's a lot of kind of active stuff there's jokes there's a bit of wine stuff and it's yeah. it, it all seems a little bit incongruous. But that's incongruous to what other people know. That's not incongruous to me. So if it's not incongruous to me, it's genuine. And if it's genuine and it's authentic, then it's right. And people connect. Yeah. So I just do me. Yeah. And like, yeah, I am all these things. But people go, oh, how can you be a, um, a you know a wine expert um, and enjoy wine and and uh, drink and then go and do these extreme things? And I go, because I can, because mm. I do. That's how. I'm not trying to be one or the other. I just do me. And me is all of those things. I love that. Oh, mate, I used to try to, you know, I talk about it because, I, and I said, you know, one of the greatest challenges I've had in my mindset was trying to reconcile and fight that diversity in my own mind and my my own interests i've always had <clears throat> lots of i've always had lots of interests and they seem incongruous mm. right like I, I i've always liked wine but i really love footy and i like cars and i like motorbikes but also like reading and i really like art um so you know it's like these things don't make sense People who are in art don't like footy bullshit like what maybe they don't but i i like all of these things but then I had a moment where I was like, I like all of these things. Why can't I just focus on one and just be that one thing? Why can't I just be that one thing and just be, you know, just be a comedian or just do this thing or just have this interest? Why do I have to? And then I kind of sat with it and and like literally meditated on it. And I worked with somebody uh, as a coach to try to, you know, help me prepare for SAS Australia and during that course I just kind of sat with it and I went I'm all of these things and all of these things are what makes me so if I if I feel like I want to be interested in that thing 
but I also want to be interested in that thing, but normally those two worlds don't meet, then that's somebody else's problem. That's not mine. I, I like these things. I'm interested in these things, and I want to skill myself in this area, and I want to skill myself in this area. That only makes me more unique. Mm. And was the acceptance of myself as, like, literally had a moment of going, I accept me for who I am, and I am different, and that's okay, and I am unique, and that's okay, and it's good. And if I do, you know, if I go and get another qualification or I, I take another interest or I take on another um, uh, a challenge or whatever it is, that's me. That's what I do. And that's okay. And as soon as I kind of reconciled that, I went, oh, okay, I feel different now. I feel different about me. I feel different about what I'm going to do and how I'm going to push forward with my life. It's really cool, man. I love that. And it feels like you're, you know, like when you say those things, it feels like you're in a really good spot of who you are and you believe who you are and you, you love what you're doing. And I think like I've been guilty of this as a younger guy because I really relate to what you're saying around you think you're pigeonholed into one thing. Yeah. And it's almost like you feel guilty in a sense that if you don't go 100% into it, are you, are you yeah. going to like jack of all trades, jack master. Of all, yeah, exactly. jack of all trades, master of none. But what I've realised is that is people are so different. And you're talking. We're talking before about the Nathan Buckley thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you love Collingwood, as you said, and you're listening to him. And one of his big epiphanies was not treating all the team as himself. And like yeah. people listening to this today, it's like, firstly, we have no fucking idea what we're talking about. All we can talk about is our own experiences and what we've learnt personally. Yep. But I know for a fact, and I've used this analogy so many times that I that I regret because. As a young bloke coming out of footy, I was like teaching, sort of go back and talk to clubs and talk to these young blokes and be like, guys, you know, you've got to have something else on your plate. Um, you've got to go and find an interest outside or find hobbies that you like doing or find something. And I was like, do you think fucking Dustin Martin goes and does a podcast? Like, he's the best at what he does. You know why? Because he goes 100% into it. That's yep. why he's the best. Yep. But me, the best thing for me was to do different things. Yep. And the best thing for you was to do different things. Yep. So it's like, it's the boiler mentality, right? It's like yep. working out, you know, you've got 10 boilers. Yep. Sometimes you've got to be 100% into something. Sometimes it's 100% into comedy, but yep. sometimes you're 10% into art, media. Like, it's just being, fucking work it out, you know? Yeah, but you know, I think what you've hit on there is it's a really good point. You, I reckon, you've kind of got it. And I think sometimes people miss the point is that, and I certainly did for a period of time, is that I stopped trying to be the best of somebody else. Like I'd look at somebody else and try to be the best of mm. them, right? It's like going, oh, I want to be the best Robin Williams. Yeah. Or, you know, I want to be the the best um, of, of any other person when I was just going, I don't have to do that. I can just be the best at me. Because if I do the best at me, I'm going to fucking brain it. Mm. I will kill it. I will. Be, if I do the best of me and I be the best person I can be and build myself continually to do that, I can't fail. Mm. I can't fail being the best of me. Unless I don't I, I choose not to do it. And that's why, you know, you, that's that accountability of saying, well, I, so long as I'm doing the best job of being me, no one else can do that. No one else can be the best job of me. Mm. So why would, and I wouldn't ask anybody to be, so why would I want to try to be the best of somebody else? You do can you, take those elements, but yeah. like, you know, even if you follow somebody and you go, I'm going to be the best at that job. Right, you might say I'm going to be the best basketballer of all time. Unreal, but you're not going to be the best Michael Jordan. So, and if you focus on trying to be the best Michael Jordan, you will fail. Mm. Whereas, you know, if you're like um, another great basketball player, and you come along and just go, I just want to be the best at that thing, then you probably stand a better chance. Yeah, it's a really interesting one because, like, I find this, and you know, Darcy producer will 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 testament to it but it's funny you say that because i'm thinking about my situations that i'm sort of how i get motivated for things and i'm very true on the fact that like i don't i'm not competing with anyone Mm. i'm competing with myself Mm. but also i am motivated by other people Mm. so like it's fuck it's really hard because i want to be the best i can be yep but if i see someone doing something there is that part of me i'm like fuck you like (laughs) I'm going to be better than that. <laughs> but me, yeah. you know, I don't want to be you, but yeah, I, yeah. I want to do better for me. Yeah, yeah. But it is an intrinsic also. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's that's all right, though. Yeah. Like, that's. I'm not, I don't want to be Michael Jordan, but I want to be my version of Michael Jordan. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And that's what you should be. But also, too, you know, that, that comes back to particularly people with very, very competitive mindsets. Like, I'm, I'm hyper competitive. But you would be in your. Because it, 
comedy and f- sport and business, they're all the same fucking thing. Oh, it's, Mate, it's everything, it, I want to write a book one day called It's the Same Fucking Thing. Yep. And it's just everything is the same. Yeah, it is. It's it really is. It's all like, the same. You like that one, does? Yeah, I like the title. I, like, yeah. I like the title. I don't like what's inside the book. <laughs> you know, the title's good, right? The title's good. You know and what? That's all Actually, it is, really. You know like, like even don't even write a book. Just send a fax. Yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> write an email. Just say that it's and an just idiot. send it out. Like I don't know that everyone needs the three hundred and forty yeah. pages. Yeah. Well, there's not much substance to it. Like it's in the title. <laughs> really. <laughs> write it on a on a napkin and pass it over, and we'll 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 all take joy from that. We should start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I like original things. That'd yeah. be a great idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I look, I think you've got the right attitude, and I really admire it. I think you know, once you can kind of, you know, just be be happy with saying I am competitive, and I want to, I always want to drive myself to be better for myself. But also, too, along the way, I want to beat other people. Mm. I do want to beat other people. I look at people and go, I want to beat them. I don't want to be them. Beat I want to beat them. Yeah. Two and that's letters. the difference. Yeah. A T. Yeah. The end of it. That's it. A T. I think there's a, there's actually a good quote in that. I, I can actually see this on Google. You know, what I'm talking? it's like I don't want to be crossed out. E A. Yeah. yeah. It's a, like an it's a Nike slogan yeah. that they can take if they give me money. Yeah. I don't want to be them. I want to beat them. And that's true. Like you know, I'm hyper competitive. This is. This is insane. But the other day, I was at the um, I was at the blood bank um, doing a plasma donation, right? Uh, and if you can donate blood, go. Michael yeah. Klim hit me up. Klimmy hit me up on a DM. I'm going to do that. Yeah, Klimmy hit me up on a DM and guilted the shit out of me, so I went and did it. Yeah, and did it. Um, but anyway, I was, I, was, <laughs> I was hooked up to a machine. There's a guy next to me. He's probably about the same age. And uh, I could see like his, his count going up, like yeah. how many mils are going up. And I shit you not, I looked at it and I went, I'm going to beat this bloke. Yeah. He started early. He's got a head start on me. And I'm not joking. I started pumping the squeegee in my hand, just going, force that blood through the machine, tiger. Yeah. And then I'm going, look at it. I thought to myself, what does it matter? Yeah. He's You're trying on, to compete with somebody to donate plasma, he's, you he's moron. He's probably on blood thinners, and it's just like I going sh- quicker. Performance and- enhancing drugs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not performance Enhanced enhancing games. drugs. We're going to talk about that. Um, you know a really, really cool story about competitiveness, and I think it shows how important but also if you're not getting the full picture of things is a really cool analogy and a really cool story and i'm going to try and work this in i'm getting better at storytelling my brother-in-law was in new york good time to start noticing yeah. that yeah. how many <laughs> how many hundreds of episodes yeah. you doing? it's, it's, it's a good at this thing that i'm doing it's a work in progress <laughs> the my brother-in-law was in um new york and he's a really competitive dude too like just works in business sport all the same shit as yep. we said okay yep. so he's like uh similar sort of typical to us and he's running around Central Park and he's doing a lap and he's catching up to this old guy who's probably like 20, you know, maybe 50 metres in front of him. It's a 10K loop, I'm pretty sure, Central Park, for those who haven't run it. Can I haven't run it, it? but okay. I'm familiar with it. Okay. I know what 10Ks looks like. Yep. yep. <laughs> and he's about 50 metres away from this bloke, gets to 40, gets to 30, you know, on this, slowly trying to track him down. Because you know when that you're running and there's a yep. person in front of you, you go, oh, I just got to fucking catch him. Yep. Anyway, he sort of makes his way up to him gets right to him. They're probably three Ks to go and they're fucking battling out. Like this bloke's like 30 years older than him too and he's like, hey, I can't let this bloke beat me. They're running. It's neck and neck. Like he's just going and it's just about to finish like a K to finish and he just jumps off and like burns him. Probably beats him by 15 metres. And he finishes. He's like, thank fuck I fucking beat him. Like that's fantastic. The bloke comes past 20 metres and he goes, I'll see you on the next lap, mate. And just continues to just keep running. Oh. Around. Boss move. And I'm like, boss move. Isn't that just a good analogy for competitiveness? It's yep. like, you don't know what you're actually... Yeah. There's no finish line. There's though. no finish line, really. Yeah. That's it. It's true. Don't do not do finish line. I was told that when I first started commercial radio, our boss very wisely said to us, just understand that, you know, with radio, commercial radio, um, you're going to run a marathon and when you cross the line, you keep running. I was like, what? And he goes, you just keep running. And mm. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you will cross a line and you'll feel like you've finished a marathon. And he goes, and then you will just keep running again. And that never stops. And I was like, oh, yeah. And that's how it was. Mm. But it is because, you know, that was one of the best pieces of advice I, I got before going on SAS Australia because it is, you know, it's something that soldiers understand before they go for proper selection mm. in special forces is do not set your target on that finish line. Always 
always something up there. There's always there's always another part. There's always and that's what they do to you because you know the mindset. And I saw this evolve was you know they would give you a task and this is what they do in special forces. So I might be like you know run ten k's and get to the top of that hill. Right, that's there. Go up there and get that flag. And I'd be you know you'd be running on it and I'd be just going. I bet when we get there. They're going to make us pick up something and run a little bit further. There is no way known that that is the goal. They're going because people set their minds to once I get to that, then the pain for me ends. Mm. So they set their limitation. If you don't, if you believe that the the limitation is beyond what they've set, when you get there, there's no disappointment. Mm. You, they've actually met your expectation. So when you get there and they go run back down or do ten more. Or here's a hundred more, or do this for another hour, or whatever like that. Having had that mindset in there, I was always expecting that fuckery to happen. So I was just like, when it happened, I was going, yeah, well, met my expectation, yeah. and so I was never, it never, it never broke me. But I saw a couple of times when we would, you know, cross the finish line, as it were, and people would go, oh, and I'd be going on high alert, waiting for it. And they go, ah, oh, and then the, the DS, the soldiers would say, right, I go back down. And you just see it, you'd watch, it'd just drop over their eyes of, oh, no. Whereas, like, I'm still, I haven't put down my pack. Yeah. I'm still on my feet. I'm ready to go because I knew. And so when they would do it, it would actually fill the loop of, I expected that to happen. You've done it. You've reinforced it. So I'm on track. I'm I'm on track. I'm doing the right thing here. So I'd be running off, and I'd actually feel better, not worse. I love that. There's a really cool quote. I don't want to. I'll tell you who it's by after it. It better it, be me. It's is not, it me? It probably he might have got it from you. Goggins, fuck you. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's something like this. It's like it's not about gaining it. It's maintaining it. Mm. And you know who that's by Pitbull. You've you use a lot of quotes from Pitbull. I do love people. Yeah, I know. I love I've people. Heard them. And the second part of that is, I want to tell you the contrary of what happens. Like, you know how you were saying before, you're the guy that didn't put the pack down? Mm. So David Butterfin, who you would be aware of, Collingwood, um, yep. worked with Mick Malthouse. Yep. yep. He yep. came to Carlton. I actually, the part that I wanted to talk about later with you is he does these things called Resilience Builders, where it's like camps you go on. And I went yep. on one two years ago. And I'll talk about that later. But... Long story short, in preseason, which is you know not comparing that to the SAS, but it's a, a similar type thing. You're pushing yourself, not knowing when it's done, and it's all the same shit. Remember, it, life's the same shit. He had this rule where one, you, you don't ask, you, you're not allowed to know when things are finished, so mm. you can't say like how many reps or when are we done or mm. any like you just don't know. So yep. there's just that level of it, you don't know when it's yep. going to do. Anyway, this one day I learned this lesson very early was. It was my first year. We're doing these like up and back sprints, and we I don't I lost count of how many we're doing. He said, "All right, whoever wins the next one is out. Like you're finished for the session." And I'd been probably probably second last, third last, fourth mm. last, fifth mm. last, sixth mm. last, like in this whole period. And I was like, "Oh fuck yeah, this is my time <laughs> to get out of this." So I've gone fucking oath, like sprinted up, <laughs> yeah. sprinted back, won by about ten meters. <laughs> And he's just like, mate, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, you've been coming literally last, <laughs> and now you've just won that. He goes, you're not only staying in, like, you're going to be doing, like, 13, like, extra ones because you've yeah, just man. saved. And I was like, that is such a good lesson. Like, yes. It was such a – it was a big ego hit, obviously. And I don't yeah. tell that story proudly because it's not who but that's good it on represents you. today. But yeah. it was me at that time. It was just – yeah, but you've, you've done what, it, what you know, 98% of the population yeah. well, would do. Well, you don't know what, until you know it, you know? Like, give, we, we live in an instructive society. People mm. give you instructions, you follow them, yeah. right? And in football, in, in the military, in show business, or in, in multiple disciplines, people give you an instruction, you follow it out. But, you know, one like I said, you know, with, with SAS Australia, for the TV show, when I was going in, I had a couple of um, special forces blokes on, I'd give me great advice, and they just said to me, just remember, everything is a trap. Yeah. Everything is a trap. There's n they're never not going to... E everything's a, a trick and a trap. If you approach it like that and it happens to not be a trap that time, then and good then, on you. Yeah. Go and eat a lamington. But it was such... those That lesson that you can learn around the marathon or the sprint yeah. the analogy is incredible. Because yeah, I, yeah, I use it. It's, it's so... But that's great. That, I no, love but, the fact that you both... Yeah, the, the humiliation <laughs> and the... like. 
I like even the year after just you know it, it oh. became a like last rep hero like just all these things and I was like one I was ashamed and I was like I never want to do that again but what two, well just it was like obviously it wasn't emptying out like you got to empty you shouldn't have been able to do that so it was yeah, a mistake around you know working because you hard. didn't you hadn't given enough in the lead up to it that you well, had look, enough I've always been working hard but you don't know how hard you can work until you get pushed right yeah, until yeah. you know there's an end point the 100% exactly yeah. so it was just learning that around those yeah. things but also now it is such a big one for me with everything I do around like you know it could be pods it's like that's not recorded till it's recorded you know but like yep. Mary's coming in today but until it's actually done yeah it's not real. It's until it's released. It's not done. Yeah, true. We could fucking lose the audio. True. Like, and Darcy's done it before. Oh, I don't up. think we'd lose. No, he, he yeah. has. Yeah. So he there like is those Hollywood. parts where I feel like it's held me in good stead from yeah. learning and fucking up and yeah, in those parts. Oh, absolutely. Best lessons in life. Are, you know, it's like the the hard road is always the best journey because you learn. Mm. You know, it's like you don't. I say this about comedy all the time. You know, for particularly for young kids, is that good gigs don't teach you anything. Yeah. Tough gigs teach you something, right? And like it's the tough gigs that build your character. Like when you're young and you're starting out in stand up, it's it's pretty tough. Like you know, particularly when you first go and do like a regional gig somewhere like that, and you can just you could get eaten alive, or it can just be absolutely soul destroying, but or it could just be a disastrous gig you know just it, the setup's terrible the mic doesn't work or you know the the people running it are a disaster whatever those are the things that then become stories that then become material that then become stand up mm. but you don't learn anything from good gigs all you do is feel you feel but you don't learn you might you know you might learn oh i did that good but that's like building on something you know but like you will learn lessons from the hard road so um, with stand up and I, I think with comedy in general you know there's a lot of people now who are um, fast laning it to the I call it it's the, it's the, it's the, the fast trip to the long road mm. so what they do is you know it, they can have some success on, on YouTube which I think is fantastic when I see comedians on, are doing well on, on YouTube and social media I really like it but then when they come to a period where they then have to grind and do the hard work and then they see it they're their idea of where they're at in a uh, profile sense versus where they're at with a skill set is not paralleled, mm. right? So with the, you know, the old way of doing it is that you would do years of tough gigs, like four years of grind, you know, driving in your car with your mates to go and do gigs in regional country, uh, Victoria, wherever, you would go and do those gigs and you'd do that grind and you were slowly and incrementally building your skill set. You're slowly and incrementally building your perception of who you are going to become. You're not, you know that you're building slowly each time. I'm getting better. I'm getting funnier. I'm also getting more notoriety and that starts to build in. And then when you become rich and famous, you feel like you deserve that. You ready? Because you've you've earned it and you've done the hard yards. Sometimes the fast trip, which is like overnight sensation on YouTube or Instagram, something like that, posted something like that, and then the difficult follow up. It's like you got that and that's great and it's awesome, but now you don't have that undercarriage of four years of of concentrated work, effort, and skill setting to then carry you further. Mm. And so what happens is their brain is elevated to I'm a success. I des- you know, I've got this. I'm amazing. But then they get imposter syndrome. It's like, oh, I don't. Maybe you know, and they, they start having self doubt. So it is a bit. I think it's great when people get that hyper acceleration, but I always believe that uh, the long hard road, the marathon, is better than the sprint. Such a good point. That we had um, Mark Howard, Howie Games, mm. on a couple of years ago, and said something that's really cool. And not that I chose this route at all, and you don't really choose your route to whatever you 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 go through. But he was saying how important he found his career was from the fact like. The Howie that he is today, doing Fox and the Howie Games and all these things, it was uh, like it was twenty years of carrying cables around and yep. being a producer and yep. just like working behind the camera. And yep. not only did that make him a more well-rounded person because he learned how to produce a show and do all these things that people want, but also the fact that it's like early in your career, yeah, you know, what you want to have those times to fuck up when it doesn't yeah. matter, and if 
not that I'm on TV or anything like that now, but say we had a platform that we do now that we're so lucky to bloody have. But imagine if I was doing that for the first five episodes, probably wouldn't be what it is today because everyone would be like, mate, you're fucking shit. <laughs> like, you're shit. So you sort of want to like, you sort of want to hustle See. and get that little bit of work. And sometimes the blessing is, yep. to, it takes a bit longer, which is hard when you're in it. It's really hard when you're in it because you want what you want. I always say patiently and patient. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great way to look at it. Yeah. You know, you, you want, you've got to be patient but it's nice impatient. to have impatience. Though. Yeah, you've got to be impatient. Oh, I'm impatient. Oh, I'm, I'm so super impatient. impatient. But you've got to be patient. Yeah, it's but but I also have like you know, I'm I'm an impatient by nature. Like I just want to yeah. as soon as something's going, I just want to do that. Like if I make a decision, I want to do something. It's like I, that, mm. let's just do this right now. And mm. the, then my intensity comes in. Once my intensity comes in, bang, it's it's on. Mm. But I can also play a long game, and I'm also able to allow myself failure a mistake and see that as a, a, over the course of a long horizon, a tiny little blip. Yeah. Whereas if you look at it in a really, really shortened horizon and you see a failure, you see too close. And it's the same with the highs. You know, if you look at it like a, you know, like a, a, a market graph or mm. something like that, yeah, where you, you have the ups and the lows. Yeah. When you expand that market over a five year period, the line looks a lot different and you get to see that it actually just kind of moves like that. And that's that's why I think sometimes with you know good and bad experiences is if you look too closely in just one little narrow scope like that, then you will you're getting a false picture. Whereas if you expand it and pull back and have a look at yourself, and you go, actually, I've had all these experiences, and that's that that you know in the moment I'm um, impetuous and impatient, but over the long run. I've played a long game. Yeah. And I'm playing, always play the long game. Seek long, do it quietly, get the work done, grind out quietly, and then bang, make your impact. I vouch for that. That's that's a great uh, structure. Anyone listening, I'd be like, that's that's the fucking, that's the motto. That's the that's recipe. That's it, done? Yep. Done. Okay, done. It's been, it's um, been good. You said something like before that I nearly like had an erection and I was <laughs> like... <laughs> I wanted to sort of... I was drinking water. Okay. <laughs> I was just as a disclaimer to anybody just listening. I was drinking water. Very important to note. And there was a part where I nearly jumped out of my chair because you were talking about what I was sort of alluding to earlier around the resilience camp and stuff. And I'm going to bring this yep. together. Yep. Because you're talking about when comedians uh, or, you know, whoever it is, building, fucking up, they're the stories that get you, right? Yeah. Like the fuck ups then turn into the next bit, the turn yep. into the next bit. Yeah. And I found that this year... I've been reflecting on the show and even just my personal growth as a person and all these things that, uh, you know, went through all these things you go through, turn into the next content for your life. Totally. Right? Like turns into the next version of who you are. So yep. if you don't do anything, you've got nothing to fucking talk about. That's right. And like, you know, went through the delisting. It's like, I've got to stop fucking bringing that up because it happened a long time ago. So okay, what? So, no, but more it's like, I've got to get delisted again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I've got to, I went on this camp a couple of years ago that I... Two things I sort of refer to a little bit. Went on this camp with David Butterfin. I'm petrified of claustrophobia. So like claustrophobic areas. Small hate, spaces. Small spaces. So I went on this camp with him to conquer that fear. And it was awesome to just do it, learn so much from it. And from that has just become a pillar of something that I did once. And I'm like, that was fucking awesome. Yep. But I want to do it again. I yep. need to do it again to have the next <laughs> lesson that comes from it. Yeah. And the other thing is like with the delisting, there's so many lessons from that. But I think what you, what I love that you do and that I want to continue to do and I think is so important for everyone is keep putting yourself in those adverse situations. Yep. Keep doing shit you don't want to do. Always. Because it gives substance to the next story that you tell when you're having yep. beers with people or if you're doing a pod. Like I'm not doing it for content. I'm doing yep. it to be a, a richer person in depth and storytelling and yep. experience and all those things. But it's crazy like the SAS, the challenges you're doing on the weekend – all those things are just one. They're good for you. Yep. But two, they're actually good for everyone else around you. Yeah. Oh, look, I think you know. There's there's two parts to that is that you know I think that uh, there is great benefit to discomfort, mm. right? And that's certainly something that I learnt from um, from doing SAS Australia. But I think I've always been okay with that. Is that there is being and that's literally what they tell you when you walk onto that show mm. the first thing that the ds tell you is say you need to start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable because you walk in there and until you walk out 14 days later you are never comfortable 
I had busted, I had two broken ribs, fractured ribs within the first 24 hours. Mm. So I didn't have any time, like that happened within two hours or three hours or something of the show. Mitchell Johnson punched me in the rib and I, it just went crack and I went, oh, and I could just feel it, like just zapped my body and I went, this is three hours in, this is gonna be a long. <laughs> and then Magnus and the big clumsy, clumsy bastard, he landed on me in an exercise the next day and I heard it go crack and I was like, oh my God. I think it was just intercostal, but it was the second rib. But um, I was so prepared with the idea that it was going to be uncomfortable, that I was all right with that. Mm. I was like, okay. And there's something about being constantly challenged with things that are uncomfortable, ice baths, um, you know, uh, something physical taking on, you know, a, a challenge of one kind or another, um, or speaking personally and being open mm. and brave. Um, they're making yourself uncomfortable is to me a growth thing. So, you know, the, 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 the saying of, um, growing pains right if you if you've got growing pains you've got pain because you're growing and for me it is about growth everything's about growth learning growths challenges overcoming them facing fears i love to face fears facing fears is growth um doing you know upping physical activity is growth you you know changing the, the fibers in your body you're doing that um learning reading um, talking to people, listening to people, growth, 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 eternal growth. Because if you don't grow, you die. All right? And I'm 50 and I've always had this attitude anyway, but I'm always like more, 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 more experiences, more things, more growth, eternal growth, eternal growth. And so that, the, the price for that often is discomfort. But if you're comfortable with being uncomfortable, you'll be fine. What was some of the biggest challenges on SAS for you? What did you think was? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hectic. Yeah. Like, I know it's just and a TV show the and people stuff, out but the air, shit a brick. I'd love to know just from, I, I already can sense the answer to this, but there is a lot of TV shows that maybe get fabricated. I'm not a nah, big, man. I'm not a big um, I, reality TV watcher, but that, yeah, genuinely feels like it's a, you know, we've had Abby Holmes on the show as well. And yeah. Yeah. It's like. It's, I, I can't speak for the, the subsequent series. I was on the first one. Yeah. Um, and. From my understanding, it might have been the toughest one because yeah. um, we were constantly cold and hypothermia was literally a daily problem for us. Um, so we were constantly uncomfortable. Um, there was never a time when you could just say, oh, I'm pretty... I'm, there was like one day where we had some sunshine, like the very back end, and we're going, this is... I feel good today. Mm. Otherwise, every single moment of the day was constant and you know i know it's a reality television show but i shit you not we walked out of a room they put a bag over our head and then the next minute um i'm standing on top of a mountain and there's a helicopter there and uh, i've passed selection and it's all over like it's that's it there's no you never speak to a producer you never kind of have like um moments where you chat to a cameraman or anything like that there is n they never break that wall it's absolutely impermeable um, so it's as real. And the thing is, like, after a couple of days, your brain just forgets that cameras are there because you are so intent on getting through task, so intent in, in mental and physical conservation that you don't care if your dick's out on camera anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, at the start, I was going, no one needs to see another cashew nut. But, yeah. like, by the end of it, I'm just going, whatever. I mean, seriously, yeah. you just stop caring. Um, but it is the, your awareness of your state becomes far more important than the awareness of the outside world. You are so focused. It feels so real. It is. It just really is very, very real. But it's only as real as you want to make it. So, um, but it's intense, you know, and I think, you know, one of the hardest things that people don't, it, it wouldn't know, and I, I don't know if this is, again, in subsequent series, but for us, because we were in the snowy mountains and it was cold all the time, it was the middle of winter, um, after a few days, we had really all of us had these micro abrasions that got infected, and so and and particularly around our hands, our hands were really badly chopped up, and so we had little infections in our hands that were constant. Um, and you don't have any coffee or milk or tea or any shit. You don't no sugar. There's not there's nothing good, right? It's pretty Spartan. Um, but we had like band aids and tape 
and that was about it. So you have to repair yourself in the afternoon, like running repairs. That's what you would do. In your downtime, you're running repairs on yourself and cleaning yourself up and cleaning wounds and stuff like that. Um, but the constant cold and combined with activity, all of us had completely numb fingertips. You could not, I literally could not feel myself downstairs taking a piss in the snow one day. I was like, I don't know if I'm holding this thing now. I don't mm. know if it's there because I've lost sensation in my hands and probably in my penis as well. <laughs> um, but it's hard to say, but we had buttons on. We, we couldn't do up our buttons. We couldn't put on our belts. Like you, the motor skills, the fine motor skills in our fingers had completely exhausted themselves and it was gone. You couldn't feel anything. And that lasted for some of us weeks or months after the show had finished. People still had numbness in their fingertips. So it's small things like that that is a constant um, sense of being uncomfortable, but also too it's a delayed response. But you know, inside it, that you know, the the what the the, the audience sees hardest part for 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 me uh, were the t- the two things that I excelled at. Were the hard, the hardest things, the hardest physical and mental things I've ever done by any level ever, and I, I won them both, mm. and uh, that's why I loved it. Which one? What were they? Um, physically, um, uh, the a mountain ascent. We had to climb a mountain through the snow with snowshoes on. I'd never worn snowshoes. Um, we had to pull a polk, which is you know um, forty kilograms, um, on a sled behind us, and uh, just before we were about to head out. Um, <laughs> I noticed that mine was back to front. So the leading edge was at the back and it was like a snow plow at the front. And I said to the DS, oh, um, sorry, just before we go, um, my, my sled's around the wrong way. Can we get me a new sled? And they just went, go. And I went, what? And I was like, oh, no, I'm so fucked. <laughs> I can't believe this. Right, and I'm just going. I'm just, it up reverse. It's reverse. So you know, like you've got like a leading edge. Like yeah. it's it's fat at the back. Yeah. But my the fat side was at the front. The way they'd rigged it. So I've got this harness on, like a husky, and it's got the fat edge at the front. And I went, I'm just going to snowplow this. This is there's no way known. There's no way known I'm going to do any well on this because I'm they're already gone. I still haven't moved, and this they're 20, 30, 50 meters in front of me. And I went, oh, they're elite athletes. There's Olympians there. I'm cooked. And I was like, oh, man, this is, this is just a fail. This, we just chalked this one up to a fail. And uh, Aunt Middleton came over to me and he said, I expect to see you top four, number 10. And I was like, I don't think you've seen my sled. <laughs> and I just looked at him and he looked at me like, I'm not joking. I want to see you at the top of that hill. There was an expectation. And he just ignited something in me and I just went I am going to be number one and I just carved and I pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and I started passing people and passing people and then there was uh, Badger and Magnuson were in front of me and we're on a massive ascent and there's like a moment there where I was pushing up the hill and I was third and I went you have to make a decision now because I could feel my heart was beating out of my chest and I thought this is you are you are now at 100% you are absolutely red line now. This is as far as you can go without dying of a heart attack. And there's two athletes in front of me. And one of the other instructors, Billy, just came up and whispered in my ear something I will never forget. And I live by it. And he said, because he could see, he could see that I was having that glimmer of doubt. He must have seen in my eyes that in my mind, I was looking for the excuse of why it was okay to come number three, not number one. Right? And he must have noticed it because he just walked down as I was pushing up the hill and he just said, results, not excuses, number 10. And I just went, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm going to blow my heart out of my chest. And I did, and I gassed it. And I took the positions and I managed to just finish just first. So cool. And I was at the top of the hill and I went, holy shit, I've come from last to first. And so in a physical challenge against, you know, everyone on that show was fit. Everyone was good. And I was like, I I now know anything physical I'm, I'm good for. I can do anything physical now. And the other one was a mental challenge with some, with a hostage situation where I made all of the right decisions at all the right times yep. under enormous pressure. Yeah. You know what's un- incredible about that? And I love the way you've told that, that story is um, 
we had a performance psychologist on, which one of probably one of my favorite episodes. I'd love you to listen to it because you'd really enjoy it. It's Jonah Rolliver. He's Cam Smith's personal psychologist. Right. And this is one thing I do really come back to a lot in my own life, but it's confidence versus competence. Yeah. And everyone talks about confidence. So like you go into that um, challenge and you're confident you can do well, maybe come top three, but you have to be competent in something to then get confident in it. Yeah. And the fact that by you making those decisions and Billy and Aunt Middleton like saying those things to you, you get up there and you actually come first and you win. The confidence that you get from the competence of doing that is massive. like unbreakable. Yeah, massive. And it's like you've got to have that. It's, you've got to be able to do it to actually get the confidence in it. And it's just something that, yeah, it's pretty incredible. And, and like, that, that yeah. comes from sacrifice and commitment and also your preparedness to really dig deep because like I you know you hear the platitude a lot of oh, I give it 100% 100% 100% everything's 100% mm. everything's 100% 100% you know where we live we live at 70% at max when we think we're at 100 we're at like 70 or 80 when I was on the mountain I went I'm at 100% any more than this and I could actually die and then Billy comes along and goes like just looks at me like you're not giving it 100% and I went there must be more and I just found it mm. I found that extra 10% so yeah, and that's but that the competence and and the the confidence that you get once you complete something that you are not sure of. The other one was uh, the gun task where we had to um, rescue a hostage from what was a, an abandoned abattoir, and it was all weird and there's gunshots and we had no idea what was going on. You never know what's going on. There's no briefings, so I'm about to go into you know this uh, hostage take. And before I went in, I'd sat on my berg and, and I was waiting for Aunt Middle to come over. I knew I was on the jump off and hearing gunshots and explosions and shit everywhere. And um, I'm off set just waiting there. And I thought, whatever happens, happens. I can't, I, I've got to deal with that when it's in there. I can't deal with that now. What I can deal with right now is my, my state. So, and I looked around, some of the recruits were a bit chippy, like a little bit kind of, you know, as you would be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I sat on my berg and I shut my eyes and I, deliberately meditated or just dropped myself right down calm my heart rate down calmed everything down and when i'll take this moment to meditate and get the head right because i reckon this is going to be a head game so i dropped it right down and then when i entered the uh the the building they showed me a map i absorbed all the information because my mind was not thinking overthinking shit now which is a, a massive habit that i've got i took in all of the information calmly processed the weapon profile like take the safety off, make sure I don't fuck this up again because I had I'd made a mistake earlier, which really affected me um, in the very early days. And this is like maybe day seven, I think now, maybe eight, something like that. And then I went through and just processed all the information, but super calm. Mm. So when I was walking through, I'm looking, checking around corners. I know that there's gunfire. I know somebody's going to draw a weapon on me. I know this shit's going to go down because I'm holding a gun and... I just went into a, a really, really flat space where I was like, I'm, my heart's up, but I'm calm. I'm really, really calm. And it was the pressure of the environment and the necessity to fulfill the, um, the task and the mission. Oh, it just went quite zen. So when I walked in, I was confronted by um, armed people. I made all of the right choices at all the right times. Two shots, two shots and only shot the, the people that were drawing arms on me. So I followed the, the rules of engagement clearly. I was concise and I knew what I was doing. But as soon as I, I went, I think, because I shot a guy who was, it was a trick, right? Like I said, there's always a trick. Mm. And a lot of people fell for the tricks and so they shot a non-combatant or they failed to shoot a combatant. Whereas I, uh, the three people in the room, I shot the two combatants who drew arms at the right time and profiled them correctly then when billy the instructor said to me he goes you were cool you were calm you were collected good get out and i was like i kind of feel like i deserve a mars bar for that yeah <laughs> you know, Come on, like, man. i reckon on. i reckon i should I, there should be a fredo frog in that for me anyway but i i walked out and that's when that's when the mental game kicked in mm-hmm. so I, I had that and i went i've just absolutely iced that that is the hardest, most difficult mental process I've ever been in, and I've nailed it. Head game is right. So then when I took on the mountain, I had the mountain, I'll go, I've got my head game and I've got my physical game. I've got the two elements that are important in this. If I can control my emotional state, 
I am not going to be beaten here. It is not going to happen. I am not coming out of this anything but victorious because all I need to do now is control my emotional state, which is sometimes hard for me. Yeah, it's extremely hard for me as well. I was The question I was like deeply thinking then is do you think that's correlated into other parts of your life that aren't as high stake? Like, oh, definitely. Because for, even, for example, for me, the last... I'm an extremely emotional person and react quickly to things. And I think over the last sort of 12 months has been a massive focus area of being, you know, almost a 24 hour rule of like, let something wait 24 hours, yep. let my emotion drop and let me like think clearly about a situation. Yep. But as I've done that, I feel like I've definitely some, you know, fluctuations in that sort of map. But if you look at back from a further picture, there's definitely, you know, trending upwards in terms of better at it. But it's such a skill, especially as, as we said, all the same shit, but in, in life and business, the, le- the calmer you can be in situations, mm. you just see how much people can control a room when they're calm. Mm. And it's even the thing of like, it's power. Um, negotiating, like it's I've power. learned now, of like just like lowering your voice, speaking slower. Like yeah. if you try and talk over someone, it shows that you just, you don't have any power in the conversation because you're trying to like assert yourself. Yep. And you just sit back, talk quiet. Yep. Silence is like everything like you can never feel this conversation sort of changing now like when you just well, yeah, bring it down because people want to match you yeah but also too you know like any good story has peaks and troughs mm. right so you know yes it you, does you got <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and good jokes in it as well <laughs> but yeah but it is like you know it, it, it is you can't have a monotone conversation but there is real power in calm yeah like you know when I see the people that I really admire and even people that I've feared it's their calm that worries me or yeah. makes me prop up not there oh, I'm going to do this and you know I'm going to crush it and it's like mate whatever Tell right it's the people who are not talking my old man gave me a piece of advice when I was a very young boy he said if you're ever in a, in a situation where you think you're going to get into a fight with a group of blokes he said and he, I never did this but he I don't even know, know my old man couldn't find his way out of a wet paper bag but he did say he said hit the bloke who's not talking not the bloke who's on the yip mm. he said because he's the one thinking and I was like, oh, my God. Unfortunately, it was not really an occasion for it. But, like, you think about that. If you've got a group of people who are potentially aggressive towards you, is it the mouth who's the danger? He's too busy talking. He's thinking about himself in that moment and how he looks and how he appears. It's the bloke who's looking at you silently, sizing you up, going, I'm going to drop him. Mm-hmm. That's, your, that's your point. So... Poor yeah, bloke, if he's just there, so this what he's what just if gets he's, dropped. What if he's not even part of the party? <laughs> he's just around, He's got a kebab in his hands. Going, what are you guys doing? <laughs> Bam! <laughs> Merrick smashes him in the face. He's got. I just. I just had, was he's getting like, some why to punch that guy. He wasn't even, <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't talking because I was eating. I was just eating. I was having a meal. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I forgot what we were talking about now, but I mean, it's all good for mental strength, something, something, something. I don't know. <laughs> just imagining this poor bloke walking out and someone's mouthing you and just gets absolutely knocked out because he's yeah. still talking. No, I'm not that violent. I don't know. No, it, hitting it, people because they're not I'm, talking. I'm joking. It makes um. Otherwise, Darcy sense. would be in massive trouble right now. <laughs> it makes complete sense. Um, on the show, there was Ant Middleton I'm, I'm obsessed with. Like, I just find his everything about him super interesting yeah he's a weapon what do you think were some of the biggest like you spoke before about Billy and those messages coming through was there anything else like that that just sort of clicked and hit you and you're in that sort of flow state that they passed on or was it even looking at you know one thing I love about those situations is Mm. as much as you're in a individual environment you're in a team environment too yeah it's learning things about other people like you know we went in multiple pre-season camps again same shit on different different levels yep but it's what you learn about teammates when they're under pressure yes. and other people and what you learn about yourself when you're with a team that you don't want to 100%. let people down and stuff. Like, was there any other things that sort of stood 100%. out to you? Oh, I mean, definitely. I mean, I, never in my life, I, I should say, you know, I know it's a television show, but I've never, ever been more grateful for an opportunity in my entire life mm. on any level. It's the best thing that I've ever done, not because, you know, I completed it and, and got through it. Um, it's because I got through it. But it was also to, it gave me the preparation. It gave me that lead time to start changing the way I thought mainly and, and also to my, my physical strength and my ability. Um, but it's the, the tools and the lessons and the disciplines that I took from that now are still compounding. Like, you know, almost yeah. what, three and a half, four years on, it's still compounding. You know, it's habit stacking. Yeah. But it starts with that, that kind of 
um, momentum that they that they did. But to, to kind of answer the question, the you, there's two sides to it that I really really learned. You know, everyone sees it from outside, but when you're in there, it's a it's incredibly different viewpoint of how the public would perceive that that show in that environment right um and there's two things that really pop up is you will never know yourself better you will see every part of you because there is and everyone else will see your true personality um, which i think changed a lot of people's opinions about me as a person because there is nowhere to hide after a few days if you're trying to put up walls or facades or anything like that you'll get you'll get found out there is nowhere to hide. And they tell us that. There is nowhere for you to hide. We're going to break you down into a million pieces and we're going to see you for who you really are. And you go, shit, a brick. And that is exactly what happens. So you get broken down. You see yourself, how you respond to to environments, situations, pressure, um, challenges, um, uh, physical and mental, everything, right? You see how you are and... If you're comfortable with that, what a win. It's massive. It's massive. So I walk out of that and go, I'm happy with that. And I had challenges on that show, no doubt. I had a a confrontational clash with one of the other recruits. And I don't regret it because I stand by what I did at the time. And and I would do it again because that was a team thing. I'm a very, very team-orientated person. I love teamwork. I love working with, the, with people. John, that was Stephenson. Was no, that? no, I, I had a clash with Frastarani. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was it was basically because I felt like he wasn't doing the yeah. right things for the team, not for me. It had nothing to do with me. I was fine and I was doing well, but I felt that his actions were um, selfish yeah. and that they were affecting other uh, members of of our um, our team. And that really got on me. And I could see that other people didn't want to do it. I was the oldest person there. And um, I felt like it would have... I got to a point where I went, if you don't do this, if you don't confront him over this and bring it up with him... And I had, you know, off camera, that was never shown. I had made approaches before about trying to get across to him that I felt like he needed to be a bit more team-minded. But I felt that he wasn't. And that's the way I, I felt at that time. Um, and I, so I, I went, all right, I'm going to do it. And I could tell that no one wanted to do mm. it. But I also said to the other recruits, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to do it unless you all believe Everyone, that yep. it needs to be done. This is not going to be a me consensus. This is a group consensus. But we're going to have a chat to them about this. Because this is really affecting people. And we're losing, we're losing people. I see that we're losing people as a result of this. Mm. It's funny when you're watching that show right because you're thinking fucking hell they're taking this seriously right but when you're in those moments you're not thinking about literally anything else but survival like just getting through hey it's just correct and maybe i'm sure a lot of people can relate to that but i think a lot of people probably can't because you unless you go through something like that you there's not you're not thinking about emails you have to send when you get home like you don't think (laughs) that shit just doesn't come up it's like pure it's just like you start thinking about like literally you go I wonder how many calories are in a grain of rice yeah because you're just constantly hungry look it's all survival yeah and part of that survival mechanism is we uh, we need to be a team we need to be a team we need to we all need to get for us to, for any of us to get through this we need to work mm. as a team Badger had an awesome saying which I, I say all the time now but he said to us when we were at, at a moment on the course he said if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go as a team. Mm. And I was like, awesome. And I was like, I want. And I love the people we're on that show with. Pitbull says that. He says it all. He says it all. He does. He That's good. That. Yeah. Of course he does. Yeah. I mean, he's Pitbull. Um, but yeah, it's like that was that was a, a bit of a, a flashpoint. But it's um. I think that that experience uh, of being on that show has tempered my mind and tempered my, and uh, it's, I think it has uh, changed my ambitions mm. to be far greater than they were. And I'm very quietly processing those ambitions. Like I said, you know, you work, gr- do the grind and then show the result. Yeah. Don't tell the result before you've done the grind. So I feel like I'm in that phase now where I, I'm, I've been grinding for, for years, working on things quietly um, post SAS, but I was incredibly skilled by those people. Mm. Ant and Billy and and Foxy and Ollie, those those four men imparted so much to us, like a gift. 
And the show to me was a gift. It, it got me out of a funk, a mental funk. It got me driven. It got me motivated. It gave me back my confidence. I came out of there. I was like, well, I've done that. Do I went to go and do that thing. And I did that thing that I said I wanted to do. So I fulfilled that loop, which I live and die by, which is if you say you're going to do something, do it. Don't, don't say it. Don't say it unless you're going to do it. Because all you're doing is if you say you're going to do something and then you don't do it, you are reinforcing to yourself that you are a failure or a quitter. Mm. So don't say it. Do it. And that's what I say to people. If there's one thing about me. I say, if I say I'm going to do something, it's going to get done. It's going to get done. Yeah, I like that. It's actually funny you say that too because I, on a, I'm just thinking about that personally. I would like to say that hopefully... I would think of that of myself too. But I actually use it in a different analogy of like, I say I'm going to do things, so I do them. Yeah, yeah. So like, I like to sort of speak yep. it and say, yeah. like my business partner, Baldy and Darcy, um, probably feels this all the time. Like, I'll just say that I'm going to do something yep. just on an episode. And they're like, why the fuck are you doing this? I'm like, well, it actually holds me accountable yes. to then actually fucking going and doing it. So like, 100%. I have to do it. Just like, yep. even if I don't really want to do it, I'm just going to say it. So that it's there, it's out there now, yep. and it'll happen. Yep, it's like I mean I've done that. I do that a bit. I, I think you're right. That yep. when you put it in that context, absolutely, mm. say it and then go and do it. It's the it's same thing. Like it's just work it. You know, just talk a big game. Mm. I talk a massive game. Talk a big game, but then follow it through with the results, and that's fine. It's just when people like when it's disingenuous when people say, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna do a marathon or something like that," and just go, "Well, what's your program for the, for your marathon?" Oh, yeah, I haven't got a program. Well, you're not doing a marathon. Yeah. You're going to find it very difficult. Um, whereas, like, funny, somebody goes, oh, you say that, actually. That's what we're doing this year. Marathon? I was just thinking, well, we, what, what is your program? What are you doing? Are you doing, well, are you doing the GC because it's easy? We're, well, I've did, we did the Melbourne two years ago. Yep. Doing the GC this year. Yep. Um, oh, that sounds right then. Up in Gold Coast. <laughs> uh, yes. This, look, let's be honest. There's no easy marathon. Oh, the GC is pretty easy. Oh, it's okay. pretty cool. Well, we'll just shut the fuck yeah. up. It's like Diet Coke. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's funny because like I don't really have a program at the moment, but I know that because I've committed to it and I've built this whole thing around it, like it's going to get done no matter what. Well, at least you'll, at least you'll try it. Like yeah. you'll go there. Like if you go there and quite likely after 10Ks you blow a calf because um, you know, you've know you got chicken legs and it'll blow out. I'm strength training at the moment. Yeah. I'm doing my building my strength before See? I actually start my running. So, that's so I commitment. do have a plan. I do actually have a plan. Well, that's a commitment yeah. to it though, yeah. right? But if you go to the, to the GC and you start running it and something goes wrong, you haven't failed. No. It's just... it's. Just, well, you've got to give yourself the best chance to get it done too. Yeah, so, failure's fine. Yeah. Like that's a failure's good. Like mm. failure's good because it gives you another opportunity. Quitting, I don't like. No. Quitting's different. Quitting's not a failure. It's, it's that's the failure to, to see it through. Mm. But like you know, if you, I've, I know that you do that, and I think it's great. Like, say you're going to do something, and then go and do it. If it's if it's particularly if it's something that you know measurably it, it can be accomplished. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. If, if me saying. Um, I'm going to join the NASA space program. Everyone goes, I don't reckon they want your brain. And I go, they don't. <laughs> they <laughs> they don't. really I, don't. Yeah, I failed year 11 maths twice, so I don't reckon that they're going to want my computations on board that day. Maybe another way to look at things. <laughs> Just a different Yeah, you know what? You know what we're doing? We're about to um, re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Has anybody got a lateral thought about this? <laughs> Merrick, <laughs> you're neurodiverse. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> do you, how do you think our approach effect is looking, Merrick? But Maybe. Like, but like on an ethereal level, how do you feel yeah. about <laughs> us and our approach vector? And I'm like, I reckon there's a chance we could burn up on re-entry, but I feel we should give it a go. <laughs> no, no, you don't want me on a spaceship, but I'm, I don't say stuff like that. I say stuff like I'm going to go and do the MRF or I'm going to do a marathon or I'm going to go and do something else. And I, then I go and do it. Yeah, I like it. Um, slight pivot. Please. What wine? Wine. What wine? Speak about diverse. We we did a pod here um, recently, actually last year. Yep. One of our favourites we've done. We do the series called Teach Me Please, where we get wine experts. Oh yeah. In, uh, sorry, any expert of any yep. field, and it's like yep. teach me one hundred and one about it. Like yep. let's sit down and do it. We had um, wine with Megan Mal, who were genuinely unbelievable. They came in. We did a wine testing. That got, got a podcast. Sorry, called Mine with Wine with Meg and that. Mel. You, that. You'd love yeah. it. Um, Mel or Meg. Meg, Meg is a master of wine. Yeah, it's massive. So like, 
fantastic. Yeah, I think there's one of 500 in the world. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's that's uh, uh, at least 300 and something. Yeah. Three out, so maybe yeah. 500. I don't the know. other 200 it's might not, be passed away, but 300 alive ones or something like that. Yeah, it's not a lot. Not a lot. Um, I, don't, I think we've got like eight in this country. Yeah, passes a wine. Yeah, think, from memory, yeah. I should know. But so basically, for anyone who hasn't heard it, you would know more about it. But from what she explained, like it's basically a PhD in wine. The test oh, goes yeah. yeah, it's it's, on steroids. I reckon she's talking it down. Yeah. So that's that's uh, master of wine is two levels up from mine, and that doesn't seem like a lot, but I can assure you that that is there that is a chasm between mm. my wine qualifications. So I hold a Westset level three, which is one below diploma, wow. um, which is an international standard. It's good, and I've got um, you know a, a, a judge wine shows as well. I've done some um, qualifications for wine judging, and uh, I'm a Barossa master as well. So I've got you, know, you you're legit. Yeah, yeah. So I can judge at wine shows. I was actually just been asked yesterday to judge at another wine show. And I usually judge at one show per year. I, yep. I like to slot one in because it's pretty intense. Mm. It's actually like it. you think, again, like everything, you know, people go, oh, that'd be, you're just drinking piss and having a great time. Nah. When there's a level of, of scrutiny and like that yeah. high regard, of like wine is... is it, these are people's livelihoods yeah. you're judging. Yeah. You know, you're, you're being asked politely to give your evaluation on something that somebody has toiled over. You know, a grower has made an effort to, the winemaker has made an effort to, and it's a very personal connection that they've, you know, they've made. So you've got to apply yourself in that same way. Mm. So, you know, um, it's fun when you, you know, kind of, you know, in the breaks and stuff like that. But when, you, when you're actually appraising wine, it's, you have to be super dialed in. I'm like a laser. I go full laser and get right into it and then you break and I don't drink when I'm doing wine shows at all I don't drink booze um, I stay off booze might have a glass of wine with the judges panel at the, at the dinner but I don't I don't drink because I think you've got to be dialed in yeah 100% mm. these are like I said these are these are average people and good people just making good wine you've got to give it 100% mm. Really, but it's you know, if she's, if she's got master of wine, mate, that's a level I'm not going to. Yeah, well, I'll definitely connect. You should connect up. She won't want to talk to me. I'm, no. only, I'm only level three, mate. So Sorry, she was very, <laughs> she's like, No, I mean, I can she go was talk really to you. funny. She goes, my, Oh, he's, he's one above Dan Murphy's. The, the one, my favorite quote, and please, this is from um, their mouth, not mine, but we were talking about we did a red, a white, and a rose, mm -hmm. and she referred to the rose as bitch diesel. Yeah. I call it that too. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like a I've called that in one of my shows. Yeah. 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 Um, it's great though. Rosé is excellent. It's, it's good with a bit, of, bit of ice. I do like it with ice. Yeah. She, yeah, she didn't like that that yeah. I was doing it. But no, no, um, I think you do. I tell people all the time: bang ice in it, put ice in wine, put it ice in red wine. The only red wine I wouldn't put it in is big wines like Cabernet and, and Shiraz. But otherwise, bang it in Grenache, bang it in everything. We live in Australia; it's hot. Put ice in it. What do you what, with um grapes of mirth? What so Josh um, out of the studio? His mum and dad actually went to a show recently. Oh God, that shows you how old I am. They loved it. Yeah, it's great. It's what is it like? Can we? Because there's a there's shows in April yeah. from fifth to fourteenth in Melbourne. We're coming. By the oh, way. okay. So that's yeah. that's an idiot's guide to wine. Yeah. Um, that's volume two. So I've got uh, we do a few things. So Grapes of Mirth. Yeah. Is a company, and there's myself and two other partners, um, and uh, Jason and Rowan, and uh, it was started with an idea I had before I had wine qualifications. I was just in a winery in McLaren Vale, and I was hosting a wine show um, as a, the MC, and I was going, man, comedy and, and wine's fun. Should do more of this, and then bang. So I started doing uh, outdoor live comedy events in wineries. Um, around Australia and that's grown and grown and grown and then uh, other things we do we do everything we do like corporate wine tastings and corporate events we do um, An Idiot's Guide to Wine which is a, a solo festival show that I do um, is it selling out? yeah it is whatever um, <laughs> we'll have the link in the show notes of that it's a very good show yeah um, so this is one I'm doing the where is actually, that by the way? so I'm doing it at the Arts Centre in um, the Melbourne International Comedy Festival I'm doing it in the um, Adelaide Fringe I'm doing yep. it at the Spiegel Tent in the Garden of Unearthly Delights well, anything in Victoria? Uh, Melbourne International Comedy Festival is in Victoria that makes sense mm. yep <laughs> mm. it's, it's in the title I think we should check that check the show notes um, I'm pretty sure Melbourne's yeah Melbourne's in Vic yeah anyway um <laughs> As you say, mate, you're constantly learning. I like it. It's good. Now you know the, yeah. you know the city that we're currently in. Yep. That's handy. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. So, it is got the wine. It's, it, I take, it's a comedy show, but it's about wine. And I just take people through a tasting of six different wines. Yep. And I talk about the grapes, the backgrounds, the growers, whatever. I just tell stories and, and make jokes. And then we move on to the next one and they taste it. So, the whole audience, the entire audience, awesome. like hundreds of people, 
all get six wines and they all taste it, which is a logistical nightmare. But yeah. I'm on stage, so I don't care what the other people have to do with the work. Yeah. Other people do that. And I just tell the jokes. And then I literally afterwards go and um, hug middle-aged women and then uh, show over, done. Just go around, a few cuddles and photos. With Would it be weird women? if like us, like sort of 30-year-old males, four or five of us went together? Would that be? No. Nah. People go in groups a lot, okay. and it's actually in the Indian sky. The wine is actually very um, Inf- in, informal, uh, informational. Is the word I'm thinking of? Informative. Informative. Uh, yeah. I Fuck. Mean, I feel like I've in the last. Is, no, it is no, informational. But you know what? Fucking hell! In the last like 20, <laughs> 20 seconds, I feel like we were going so well, and then it's just <laughs> fucked. Like, oh, what's happened? Always happens. What's happened? Did you peak too soon? This is like when you went for the run. Well, that's yeah. what's happened is I've challenged you to sprint. You've sprinted now. You're cooked. Yeah. Nah, you're doing well. Thanks, man. Um, nah, you, you, people come of all ages and, and all kind of different backgrounds. Over 18 would pre- yeah, preferably 18. be. Yeah. So not of all ages. No, not all ages. All right. No. See, you are on. Yeah. You, you are on. <laughs> oh, you're on par here. You're doing well. Um, yeah, but that's fun. And I love it. I love doing that because it is... What I love, I love combination of brevity and levity. I love to do, you know, that's why I love podcasts. I love when comedy is... Mixed with something else you love. Yeah. But it, as it, a blind side. How, how funny, literally, literally and figuratively, like the fact that wine and a, like the mix together mm. of drinking and listening to comedy is just... It's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. It's a great little. It's a great little thing, and people really enjoy it. It's been like a, this is the second show that I've written. I've done uh, version one, and this is version two with six new lines, and people love it. And I think it's because it's it's different. There's no show yeah. like this anywhere in the world, um, and it's 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 a very very funny show. But you also too you're learning about wine because yeah. I put in little nuggets of knowledge. But it's not a master class. It's not yeah. like come and learn about wine. It's like come and learn. Why rosé is called bitch DJ? Yeah, just to have that conversation at the pub that you can impress your mates with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I learned that so um, so many cool things about like the tannins and then the the acidity when you put your mouth down, let the saliva come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just use them a little bit. Yeah, every now and then. But not even I use that. It's boring. No, that's good. Trust me. <laughs> I, had, I, I just I just walk into pubs. Just goes, where's the bitch diesel? <laughs> and everyone goes, you're banned. I go, okay. Um, can you give us any tips just for a bottle or a winery anything that you feel is fitting for a audience to listen to in terms of wine where would you send them or what would you get them that you're really loving at the moment um i would say like you know talking about rosé i would say uh get around rosé rosé is really really good it's a um it's a i like it dry yeah. I don't like it's too yep. fruity. And we do make it we do make it pretty dry here. Yeah. Then maybe have a look at rosato. There's a difference between rose and rosato. Rosato is often made with Italian grapes like Sangiovese or uh, Nebbiolo, and it can be a bit dry and a little bit more tannic, particularly mm. if it's Nebbiolo. Um, so uh, I, I say that because I think, you know, men for a long a long time were too worried about how they were viewed, you know, in their masculinity to drink rose. It's cool now. But it is, mm. and it tastes great. It's really the only. It's it's a black grape that is treated like a white wine, mm. more like a white wine. So that's where a little bit of the colour comes from. Um, so the process is very similar to the way you make white wine, but with a red grape. Mm. Um, so rosé definitely. I mean, people. A lot of people talking about orange wine, which is I, I love I, orange wine. Well, orange is the flip. That's the flip. Yeah. That's that's a, a white grape treated like a red grape. Yeah, I'm into a black that. Grape. I'm really into the orange. Yeah, I like, tan I like that. bit of grip in it, mm. and it's got a bit of. Um, textural element to it. it sits a little bit differently mm. that's great but I would say just have a look at rosé get around rosé and um, Grenache rosé from um, uh, South Australia is excellent but also too great stuff in Victoria as well uh, so there's there is some wine ones. in Victoria is there is there wine in Victoria oh yeah yeah there's tons of great wine in Victoria have you oh. been to Victoria <laughs> you should go there <laughs> yeah I'll try it out you should check it out I've only man, been to seriously. Melbourne when you when you yeah. get time, when you get time, if you can um, get out of um, Melbourne and get get over to Victoria, I reckon you'd like it. Okay, I'll give it a crack. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, I'm going to give you free reign for a couple hours. Go, not hours. We've had it, mate. This is too long. This is probably clipping. no. Just free reign a little bit, just a sort of Collingwood dump of a 2024. I want to hear like opinions. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, I said <laughs> you want to keep in fans. limit. I said no. in you limit. Keep, you want to keep listeners, mate. Yeah. You, don't want, you don't want to hear me talk. Give about us a bit of a nuffy ramble that tonight you might get on Big Footy and post. I want to hear just a what you think's happening this year and where they're at. Can they go back to back? They will go back to back. Okay. I called them out last year that they would win the flag. Yeah. 
I think you can just see it. It's yeah. like, you know. Do you love Bo, uh, Bo McCreary? Yeah, man. Bo McCreary's great. Oh, I love him. I like all of them. Yeah. It's like, there's no players that I like. <laughs> You know, like it's like Braden Maynard, right? Everyone. Oh, I love Braden. He and I, I'm very. I want to talk about the issues around, you know, how they're changing rules based on one very, very. Oh, let's not. Yeah. Crazy Save incident, that for right? The group chat. But like, you know, Braden Maynard is like a like you can't help but love that bloke, even though like you've got no idea. He he's should, the best, mate. He's never allowed to talk into a microphone. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he signs his contracts with a crayon, um, but he is like one of those blokes. You just go. When you see him in your team giving his 100%, yeah. you just go, we will win this game. Yeah. He's such a barometer. Well, when You know, we spoke before about teams and having those people with you on those moments of, like, he's the one you want yeah. with you when you're doing hard yeah. shit. He's a warrior. Yeah. Um, We've had I, him on the pod. You, he was genuinely unbelievable. Was he talking off mic into a plant? No, he actually, <laughs> he actually, he's actually very, very... Brad, Brad, uh, on the mic. Which one's the mic? Not the fern. <laughs> The one that's not a plant. Um, oh, he's probably going to, you know, oh, I don't want to cause offense. No. I'm just joking. Just because, you know, like he's... He's he's not what you think he's like. No, I know, yeah. I know. But yeah. I think, you know, the, the perception, I'm just playing off, yeah. you know, stereotype of him. But he's he's got like, huge admiration. But you look at Collingwood. You the, know who I'm most excited for you this year? Sorry to jump in. No, no, some, is Lockie Schultz. Like that, yeah, I yeah. don't think people realise, like we've got our other show, Footy and Friends, starting next week. And dangerous, full, dangerous forward. He... To, to win a flag and have a player of his like ill coming to the team is genuinely unfair for the competition. Um, I we, watched... we've, we've had some loss there with Tay Tay out. So, and so um, yeah, I, I think Taylor that you've added think... something a little bit di- like at, at the age profile that you're getting in Lockie Schultz and what, yep. where Taylor's probably at with like if he would nearly fit into that midfield. Like I'm sure he would play, but it'd be tough with Tom Mitchell and alike to yep. all fit together. Um, I think that Schultz is a really good player. I think we've done really well. That's why I think I'm very confident we can go back to back flags because you can just see it too. But also, like what I love about Collingwood, you know, you know, this is com- kind of more about the conversation we've had previously. Is that you look at all the different personality types and profiles of people in that team. You got Darcy Moore, who's an absolute weapon, mm. right? But he's also too very, very comfortable in his skin, right? He's very, very articulate. He's a very, very good leader. Of of men, right? And then you've got stalwarts around the ground, like how is good. You've got a, um, a really diverse, and and then you've got Jordan Dugowie, who's just mm. like one minute, you know, he's getting arrested or something in Bali, and the next minute he's lacing one out for fifty two meters and turning the game into a win. It's mm. like he's got the chompers done as well. I, has I saw he? recently? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. look out, ladies! Yeah, yeah <laughs> look so, out! Yeah, but yeah. you know, and you've got you've got fully tatted up blokes, uh, you know, just old school, like hard nuts mm. in the Collingwood team. And then you've got, you know, really silky players like Pendlebury who are su- laser focused and, and like literally just velvet on the ground. So I think having that mix is really healthy. Yeah. I think that looks good as a team. No, I think that, look, I think publicly as well with all the stuff that's probably come up from the past and all those things, like they are going to always be scrutinised being one of those big four teams and oh, but, probably the biggest but they've done but that's it. only because we've got decades and decades of fucking up yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was like it was just a like couple just, of times it's, no it's every yeah. once a decade we just go I think we're due for something cataclysmic <laughs> yeah. um, tell the supporters <laughs> Ugh, it's but, exciting. We should go to a Carlton Collingwood game this year. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. I yeah. love. I love seeing any team play. I, I really. Do you get don't. down much, or do you go? Yeah, to like, yeah. You just I went to, last game. I went to was Giants Collingwood. Was the oh, yeah. yeah the semi. I was, was at that game too. That yeah. was an amazing Fucking game. Hell, it's one of the best it? games of football I've ever been yeah. to. I didn't get to go to the grand final. I missed out on tickets. Um, but you know, going the week before and, and experiencing that, it's just like that. That is one of the great sporting experiences you can have anywhere in the world. You know, it's a coliseum. Mm. It's unreal. Just but, I mean, I can go with my mates, but sure, we'll go. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and with Carlton supporters. I mean, how, how are you going to go, though? Like, Oh, mate, I'm a bit... Like, I'd love to... Um, like, I mean, because you won't win, that's all. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens nah, this Carl- year. Carlton, Carlton yeah. will get something over Collingwood this year. It's going to be really interesting. I, I wish we got Schultz. Not that I don't think we were anywhere near getting him, but it just would have been perfect to get someone like that. Yeah. Um, I'm a big Giants man, too, so I sort of spread myself. Where was, both good teams. Yeah. They could both easily make four. Yeah. But I, like as I said, I said this on the pod the other day, like I really enjoyed Collingwood winning the grand final. I just don't want them to win another one. No, I do. I don't. Yeah, I do. Yeah. 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 So. I think it's good for football for them to I win. I think it's good to win one. Four in a row. No, I, I don't think that would be good. <laughs> four in a row. At all. No, be, I just I think it's good for footy. 
Um, I think it's good for. I think it's good for I'd, people's mental health. No, I don't. I, I could, <laughs> yeah, really disagree with that. <laughs> it's good for my mental health. Yeah. <laughs> um, mate, it's been incredible getting you in today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I hope this is the start of a long friendship. Yeah, mate, I'd I love to like come it. back on. Or, yeah. I, I, oh, I, I didn't say that. I don't I think it was an more. invite. No, wasn't, just, wasn't, I, as, as it's coming out of my mouth, I went, I reckon <laughs> you've overextended the reach, you <laughs> It's not an invite. He's just saying, like, you know, maybe go to a Collingwood game or something. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. <laughs> it is awkward. Look, I probably answered none of the questions that you had there, and I've. Yeah, oh, but I'm not doing. No, no, no. When I come to, to your audience, when sorry? I come to Sydney, mm. maybe we should. Can I come for a run or something? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, absolutely. We, I, need, I need some new shit to talk about because then you can come back on. Mate, you should come then. for a run with me through uh, the national park. I live in um, Maroubra. Yeah, and um, Bra Boy. A, yeah, well, I'm not. I don't, I don't have any ink. Yeah. But the Bra Boys are great. They yeah. are legit. Um, but the, oh, that, that's one of the best Australian sort of films. Uh, docos. Yeah, it's, that's all changed now. It is all changed now. It's all it was, changed. Yeah. But, you know, th- those guys, they were young blokes then. Now they're like, you know, yeah. my age yeah. or a bit younger. Well, Kobe was on... Yeah, he was on yeah. SAS Australia. Was he on your series? No, he was oh. on, I think, the one after mine or maybe the one after He's that. a very strong-willed guy. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. was really good. Was, he did really well for a bloke with a shit ton of serious injuries yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's Kobe it's Abbotton, by the way, for those yeah. listening. Surf, yeah. surf legend. Um, but nah, man, the Bra's unreal. It's an awesome place to live. But we've got a national park that goes around the Malabar headland. Yeah. And you can run through there and it's absolutely chock mate, a full of snakes, mate. Fantastic. Oh, well, I've mate, seen you. brown yeah. snakes yeah. everywhere. Honestly, I'm not joking. Yeah. I've well, had to jump one over once. I had to throw my son over the top of a snake. It was brilliant. Wow. Yeah, okay, well, I'm day. keen to do that and then we'll, we'll. I'll throw you over the top of a snake. That'd be great. Or and then one. we'll swim at the pool. Is it Mala, mm. Malabar? Malabar. Malabar. How do you, what's the pool there? The Marne. little rock pool? Marne. Marne. Yeah, Marne. yeah, the Marn pool. Swim there. Well, you can swim down in the bay. It's full of sharks. Let's do the pool. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, mate. What's? I got a question. Oh, you got a good yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry to the listeners now. <laughs> Just edit this out. Not Just a good question, please. No, it's not. Oh, funny, oh what? <laughs> sorry, mate. You spoke about the Murph challenge. Yep. Can you tell the listeners what that is, and then I want to hear. Deal if you reckon the Mark Murphy challenge, you'd be able to. Yeah, it. is it Michael Murphy or Mark Murphy? Might be Mark Murphy. I can't. I can't. Honestly, Michael, 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 Murphy. Michael Murphy. It's Michael Murphy. Carl, yeah, it's I just Carl googled Murphy. it. So uh, Murph uh, was a um, Navy SEAL operator. I think he was a lieutenant, and mm. he was in charge of uh, a mission in Afghanistan with other Navy SEALs. They based a movie on. It's called Line Survivor with Mark with Mark Wahlberg in yeah, it. Yeah, I've seen it. So one of the guys who was shot put himself in harm's way for his team and basically sacrificed his own life for his team members to um, escape and evade. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's an absolute hero. He was awarded the Medal of Honor, which is the highest distinction in the American military. Um, and uh, he's an all-around legend. Uh, but also to uh, massive moral compass. He made moral decisions in field um, as well as, you know, um, about not just his team, but also to about potential enemy. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, good guy. Um, and there's a, a workout... Um, dedicated to to Murph, um, which is called the Murph, and a lot of soldiers do it, and sometimes they do it quite regularly. It's like a CrossFit thing, mm-hmm. so it is a um, uh, a one mile, so it's one point six k, one mile run, then one hundred pull ups off a bar, then two hundred push ups, three hundred squats, and then another mile run to complete it. Which do you reckon that's that's doable, isn't it? One. So one, point one, six, one mile run, one point, one point six k run. Yeah, hundred chin ups. Hundred, hundred pull ups. Yeah, um, two hundred push ups. Yeah, three hundred squats, and then finish it off with another. Yeah, it's fine. Would you Would you be able to do that? Not right now. You wouldn't be able uh, to do that. No, no, because that's not the Murph. The Murph's that, but then carry ten kilos on your body as well, or more. Oh, yeah. Some while you're can, doing the chins and the push ups. All of it. All of it. You wear a weighted vest. Holy shit! With ten kilos in it. Mm. And it is how long does that normally <laughs> take someone to do? Uh, it probably takes someone about 40, like some CrossFit people can do it like in seriously 30s or something like that, I think. I don't know. Not not very long. It God, took me 50 minutes. Hours, yeah. It took me 50 minutes because I just, I, the, the pull-ups, like I was literally down to sets of one. Yeah, and was, you're just getting up and just doing one. Mate, I was yeah. just dying. Yeah. I was just like, just, I've just got to get through this. Far out. That's So I can get to the push-ups. Yeah. yeah. And this could be a stupid question, but is that- There will be. Exercise, is that exercise, did he do that? Or is it just dedicated to yeah. you because it was a tough? It's a really tough. You challenge. know what? I actually don't know. Yeah. I, I assumed that it was something that I'm pretty sure that he did it as part of his regular Tra- yeah, training. Was, yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's why it was like it got his name. I don't yeah. think somebody's just gone. Oh, this looks let's difficult. Dedicated to yeah, it. let's just yeah. give it to Murph. Mm. Um, I think that's how it came about. But Fuck. it's a it's a really really good benchmark um, exercise. So I did it a couple of weeks ago in 50 minutes, which is not it's wow. not it's not great um, because I said I oh, just. The, 
The pull-ups, what? just oh, they just I feel like I me. pull-ups. Oh, you, you know, I used to be very good at pull-ups. Not as much um, at the moment, but I'm getting back into them. But I reckon the hardest part would be the the three the four hundred squats. Is it three hundred squats? Squats are. I found squats easy. Yeah, right. It's the pull ups, but the, it's yeah. the, I can't tell you the difference that the yeah the weight ten kilo versus, weight. Oh yeah, mate, sure. once you're off that bar, I was like the first the first ten. I was going, you are flying, yeah, champion. Yeah. You won't get a brain. The this. Run Go after. for fifteen because you're hot. Do it. Go fifteen. <laughs> so I just like eat that. I think fifteen on that first set. I went, you've nailed this, and I'll put my arms back up. And I went, my arms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And it was just like Tyrannosaurus Rex arms where you're just trying to get your arm <laughs> up onto the bar. Like I'm trying to throw him with these limp arms up onto the bar. Okay. <sighs> just like, oh. and there's kids in a play because I did the outdoors and there's like kids in a playground going, that man's having a stroke, dad. And the dad's like, don't look at him. Just walk away. Leave him. Leave him to die. Good we times. should try that, Dars. Yeah, yeah, you should do it, maybe, man. Maybe next year, challenge. Yeah, um, let's all go the run on. The, the, the next you run, like the mile after everything would be pretty far. Oh the, yeah, the last. Oh, I only ran it slightly slower than the first yeah, mile, right. but yeah, I want to do, I want to do a five minute mile. That's, that's cool. what I, that's what I might yeah, try to do this pretty, year. Yeah, it's pretty fast. That's quick. So what's that K pace? Uh, I don't know, like th- th- threes. Yeah, I think three minute Ks. It's like one point six K. Mate, it, I, I don't know if this is obviously a compliment, but like you said a couple of times, fifty years old. Mm. You look about like late thirties. Yeah, I do a lot of drugs. Lot of injections in my face. This is not even my real face. It's not my real face. Fuck, man, you look that clean. Mm. You look like you just had a shower and you're just <laughs> glowing. I look dewy. Yeah, like it's just <laughs> impressive. Do you take supplements or anything like that? I do. Yeah, what do you take? I do. I, at the moment, I'm um, I'm taking Athletic Greens. I'm Me trying, too. Yeah, I'm trying Athletic Greens. Yeah. Reedy from um, um, Bondi Rescue said to me, have a, have a look at this. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah. And I take it every single morning. Have yeah, every morning. I've and missed I find the last it, week, to be completely honest with you. Good but supplement. Yeah. yeah, I think I might get on board that way. Again, it's good. Yeah. What about, like, do you do anything, like, obviously ice pass and that sort of stuff, but yep. is it just, like, diet-wise? Are you just clean or you sort of just... Uh, look, I don't I don't tend to eat until um, after midday, usually. And yeah. I delay it till about 2 p.m. Yeah. Because I just have more energy. And then um, uh, I kind of eat, you know, pretty well. But I'm not I'm not puritanical at all. Yeah. You know, like it's if there's getting moving. Oh yeah, there's some barbecue stuff. shapes around there yeah. in big trouble. Yeah, yeah big yeah. trouble. Bad year to be barbecue shape. Yeah, but then what I do is I, I always say that I, during the week I treat myself like a Rolls Royce, and on the weekend I treat myself like a rental car. Yeah. So it's just like during the week, really really clean, and then on Saturday just a disaster, yeah. just bags of burger rings and ice cream, mm. and just oh is that cake? Oh that's good. Is that kids play lunches? I'll eat those. Yeah. You know, what's that? Schnitzel done. You know, yeah. it's just. Uh, like a Labrador. I like that. You gotta have balance, man. Balance. That's what it's all about. Thank you for um your time. Pleasure. It's been great. Thanks. Love to do it again. Anytime. I'm if I'm invited. <laughs> 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 <laughs>